only ask that you drop out now, um, but the, the recording is now on. Uh, just like to acknowledge and thank our partners in the series. We've got um, Royal Life Saving Society Australia, Commercial Aquatics Australia, Odium Sport and Leisure Planning Group, YMCA Victoria, the Victoria State Government, Health and Human Services Department, Belgravia Leisure, Cleaning Melbourne, VACA, Aligned Leisure, our Water and Water Accredited Facilities, EcoSave and Western Leisure Services. Um, our upcoming webinars, we've got Alison Dixon next week, CEO of Western Leisure Services in the, in the leadership stream. We've got Leadership in Uncertain Times with Professor Emma Sherry, President of Tennis Victoria and a professor at Swinburne University. Uh, we've got Culture and Values by Nathan Burke, Western Bulldogs, AFL Women's Senior Coach, and then Mental Health and Building Resilience Lessons Learned from Trauma, Tony Walker, ASM CEO of Ambulance Victoria. Um, and then that is our last session uh, in this uh, four sessions per week format during the COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, after which time we will probably move to a, a more periodical uh, version of the um, AFAR series and we'll, we'll keep you posted as to that development as well. Uh, today we've got John Summers, who is the uh, Managing Director of Leisure Management Excellence, which is a, um, uh, a, a, a consulting um, firm uh, in relation to um, aquatic and leisure and recreation facilities. So, um, John, if, you, if you're not aware of John, um, John has a, a pretty long history in the industry and, and was uh, the formerly the executive officer for recreation at YMCA Victoria it's at the sort of the height of, of the YMCA uh, facility management um, era. So John, John was responsible for a tremendous period of growth uh, at the YMCA um, in, in leisure facility management and and was instrumental in setting up the South Australia Leisure uh, Leisure Centre um, program or project as well. So um, John's topic today is a time to be bold and brave. Um, John, if we if we've got you there, if we can, um, if we if we're having any luck, we've been having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties. Um, in getting John's presentation going. John, have we got anything going now? And I've just got you on mute as well, John. You might have to unmute yourself as well. Are you, are you there, John? Hello. So it seems we're having a little bit of technical difficulties this morning, John. I, I, have I got you? Have I got you there? I can't can't hear you myself. Just just need you to unmute your microphone. It's a little mute button in the in the middle of the screen. Might, might be worth jumping in and out, John. I, I, I don't know what um, what uh, what's happening right now. Might be worth um, jumping back into the into the event. Um, I'm wondering if John could send his slides to you and you play them. Yeah. Uh, can you can you hear me now? I can hear you now, John. Well, can you see can you see my screen still? Uh, not not at the moment, no. So we'll need you to reshare that screen. Okay. How about now? It might just take a moment to come through. Um, <laughs> anyways, while 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 that's happening in the background, um, what do, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you do, John. Okay, well, thanks, RJ. Uh, like others before me, I would like to first of all congratulate you and Life Saving Victoria for putting these uh, webinars on. But yeah, uh, you gave a little bit of an outline of my background. Uh, as mentioned, involved with the, the YMCA for quite some time um, as an executive officer overseeing SA Aquatic Leisure Centre and quite, probably up to 40 or 50 aquatic leisure centres across the country at various times. But uh, more recently, I've set up Leisure Management Excellence and um, we do consultancy, we do training, we do professional development, we do regional round ta uh, tables and mentoring. So um, uh, in a bit of a snapshot, that's what we do. And um, 
just wondering after that, have you got my screen yet? Uh, John, what I what I do have um, is I've got um, I've got your slides have just come through. Terrific. Okay. So in, so we could I could um, I could just present from my screen here. Just give me one second. Sorry, everyone, for the uh, technical difficulties that we're having today. It's not uh, it's not our usual, but uh, it, is, it is what we have today. Um, one second here. So okay. I don't know if you, what you can see there, but I will just share my screen. There we go. Can you see that? I think we're off and running, RJ. Thank you for that. If everyone else has got the screen, um, once again, as RJ said, apologies for those technical issues, but hopefully now we are off and running. And um, it's interesting, the uh, topic, time to be bold and brave. I think the communication of it uh, just didn't actually have the question mark there and probably a bit of difference because, uh, in essence, the, the, the item was really to raise the question, is it really a time to be bold and brave rather than dictating, yes, it is. Um, it's interesting, just reading the newspapers this morning, the bold and brave leader of um, uh, the NRL, uh, having copped a bit of criticism for the proposed approach for the rugby. I noted that uh, they're now on tonight and they've got 70 countries around the world watching them, so probably paying dividends. But look, as far as today's presentation, I did want to note the current circumstance, you know, current climate we're confronting, and um, but really probably reflect a little bit on the industry more broadly um, in my, my views. But um, uh, really, as John F. Kennedy said many years ago, um, about a crisis, that it's a time for um, to be wary of the danger, but it's also a time for opportunity. And um, so I just wanted to approach a few ideas today. And to be honest, some of them will be a bit contentious um, and maybe some of you will be, you know, going into a bit of uh, discomfort zones. But um, nevertheless, um, if you can't have these conversations, then it really is unfortunate. So Hopefully, uh, with that in mind, uh, we can discuss these. And I suppose some of these suggestions or approaches uh, that might want to be considered is in the context of the council, and it's in the context of the managers, and it's in the context of the staff at the centre. So there's a few flipping and flopping there as far as uh, who this, you know, the options are, you know, rest with. But um, look, if you want to go to the next slide, RJ, if you don't mind. Okay, so I've got it here. I'm assuming everyone else does as well. And look, I suppose the broader climate that we've been confronted by uh, over the last couple of months is this um, unenviable challenge of uh, balancing the issues of health and the economy or the finances. And uh, by all accounts, I think the Australian government, um, with the support of the states, have done an excellent job and probably the envy of the world, whereby they've been able to, um, you know, minimise the health impacts to date. Uh, but nevertheless, there is some financial pain and the economy is really um, struggling. And the government now continues, as does other countries around the world, to get that balance right um, about consideration of people's health and about the financial circumstances of the world. And I suppose in the context of this presentation, I want to align that with what are some of the decisions that we're going to be confronting within our aquatic leisure industry. And uh, once again, look at it in the context of finance and health and uh, what we may well be finding ourselves confronted by, uh, more so now with this crisis before us. And uh, obviously there's a range of other issues that are, you know, in consideration of um, when we operate these aquatic leisure facilities, need to say environment and the like. But uh, I just wanted to hone in on these two and parallel it to uh, the broader challenges that have been confronted, as I said, around the world. So within a, an aquatic leisure facility, um, and I do appreciate you setting some time aside now, um, noting that pools are ready to be open again on Monday. But as far as the, the financial impacts, I suppose many of you would might know more than me, but really my understanding is most aquatic leisure for centres um, do operate somewhere between a a million dollar loss and a million dollar surplus. And that's uh, probably not taking into account depreciation 
um, and major maintenance and replacement, but probably somewhere in between those sorts of figures. I note that um, some of their data coming out from Fitness Australia saying that they anticipate that 15% um, drop off as a consequence of the coronavirus and some great stuff uh, that's being shared um, by Align Leisure. I don't know if people have better look at that data, but noting that they are up to about 10% of people that uh, are unlikely or you know um, very unlikely to return and another 8% uh, are a bit unsure. So whilst we open, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what sort of patronage we have in contrast to what it was previously. Um, you hear figures of, as I said, those uh, of Fitness, uh, Fitness Australia and of Lion Leisure, probably around that 20%, 15 to 20% mark. And just assuming that it is 20%, and we are looking at a, a $5 million aquatic leisure facility with income and expenditure of 5 million, we're probably gonna have another million dollar shortfall if our income is down by 20%, <clears throat> excuse me. So to potentially some centers that are incurring up to a million dollar loss could be up to a $2 million loss. So. I just don't think it's something that um, uh, councils can afford to um, overlook. Uh, I've listened to Nick Cox on a previous uh, conversation piece here, as well as um, Simon Weatherall uh, saying, well, gosh, under these circumstances, no apologies, you've got to look after the organisation. And uh, in some cases in a private sector, uh, there's no fallback, but certainly in local government, there might be a bit of cushioning, but I anticipate that there will still be need, need to be um, you know, some awareness or certainly a lot of awareness about the financial implications and how to manage that. So what are the options available? I'll throw in a few here. And as I said, some of this might be uncomfortable space, but um, closures. Um, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, right now, certainly in Victoria, uh, I'm aware that quite a few facilities are looking at opening again on um, Monday, certainly their, well, their aquatic space. Um, I believe City of Melbourne as one facility is um, well, for their facilities are currently um, awaiting. They've spoken about September, but it is an interesting one whether councils really should be opening. And once again, as I said, this is contentious and I'm sure that some people listening are going to say, well, gosh, we've got an obligation to open. That's the expectation. And I, I'll go into that in a moment about the obvious health benefits, uh, which is on the flip side. Um, and, and I suppose closures in the context of the aquatic leisure centres is looking at um, whether there will be reduced hours, whether you really do need to open between 12 to 4, or whether um, you actually only open the pools and the rest of the facility is closed, or um, how you might operate. But um, certainly that is an option. Uh, there is certainly challenges in local government on uh, the inability to access JobKeeper and as a consequence, uh, you know, councils are redeploying a few, uh, quite a number of staff, so the financial expense, financial implications mightn't be as great in opening. However, those who have stood down staff, there could be those implications. Once again, if we're talking finance, um, and it might be the elephant in the room, some people would say well, you don't want to go there, but I don't think in terms of being responsible in, in regards to the current financial position, can you avoid looking at this broader issue about the management models? and the way in which the aquatic leisure centres through local government are operated. Give or take, 50% currently are operated outs outsourced and 50% are operated in-house. And uh, there's a range of strengths and weaknesses of both models, but from a financial perspective, we just set aside whether there's an opportunity, you know, whether the outsourced model do actually generate greater participation or have greater purchasing power and whether there's differencing in the corporate overheads there's one that's indisputable, and that's the wage expenses between the two, um, two models. Certainly outsource, operate under the uh, Fitness Employees Award, and um, the local government operate under various EBAs. And that's an interesting one, those EBAs. I've recently been doing some work and noted the costs uh, of the local government EBAs, where I've looked at about half a dozen of them, do vary anything from a 20% higher level to a 50%. So once again, if you're looking at your $5 million income expenditure of an aquatic leisure centre, and you're looking around about 60%, which are uh, related to wages uh, of a $3 million um, expense uh, of wages, by having it in-house, you potentially got an additional $1 million expense. 
So um, as I said, it's not to be considered in isolation, the wage difference, but it's certainly something that I don't think can be overlooked at this time, particularly at this time with the greater financial pressures that will be confronted. And I suppose that that discussion quite often is one which relates to um, the, the usual suspects of contract managers, but I suppose it's an interesting time to consider other approaches potentially, which relate to um, uh, leasing. Um, uh, certainly there's a couple of, at least two councils in Victoria that do lease out the facilities to various operators or other facilities that actually have a swim school by, run by a third party or a health club run by a third party. Um, I, I get the next screen, I, I do go into some other potential options in that regard. Um, and look, the, the other thing is the issues of wage rates, which relates to those management models. And it's interesting, as I said, having looked at about half a dozen of these um, agreements, that the, the wage differentiation is anything from 20% to 50%. And obviously it's quite complex making a straight, you know, comparison to comparison based on casual rate, uh, casual rates, uh, weekend loadings, um, senior staff in contrast to swim teachers, number of years work. It's not a fun task, but nevertheless, having gone through that exercise, it is interesting to see that there is this 20% variance up to a 50% variance. And the reasoning behind how some of those wage rates have been um, uh, you know, derived, and it's clear that certainly those that are close to the 20% variance, um, they probably had a bit of a lever there related to their consideration of transitioning to outsourcing or their um, uh, uh, reverting back to in-house operation and probably getting some uh, greater receptiveness in terms of discussions with uh, unions. And as I said, this is a bit of contentious and potentially some of these uh, the suggestion might be, you know, a consideration for people listening here. But one of the great things is, is that uh, any of those transitions do occur that uh, the current staff are protected. So uh, uh, under transmission of business or and or um, uh, grandfathering of uh, rates. So look, I've got that yuck one out of the way. But I, as I said, I don't think you can overlook it. Um, and um, as I said, it's an elephant in the room, but nevertheless uh, wanted to be discussed. Pricing's an interesting one, I suppose. Uh, apart from reducing expenditure, you've got the opportunity to increase income. And the income can be increased, I suppose, two ways. One is through the prices you set, and one is the number of people who are paying that price, i.e. increasing your patronage. So in terms of the, the um, pricing, um, I suppose it's gonna be a time where you're gonna be wary about increasing fees. However, it is an interesting one when you reflect on some of the constraints um, that are going to be placed on centres about the you know, 20 people per area and um, and certainly you know, limited uh, access to pool space, once again having that, and whether there should be premium services that um, centres might want to consider offering, um, as well as um, other pricing options, which might include reciprocal access, um, the other thing, which is a, probably a broader issue, is within the aquatic leisure facility uh, beyond the current climate, uh, is looking at uh, where it sits in the marketplace in contrast to other facilities. Um, and I'll probably go to that in a bit more detail a bit further, but certainly you've got you know, the pools and you've got the health club facilities and the, the packaging of it all up in regards to swim lessons and family memberships. I would think that it would certainly um, uh, provide opportunities there. The last one, um, <clears throat> actually, probably if the earlier comments were contentious, this one is about exiting from aquatic leisure facility provision. And that's probably a, a longer term one, but it is an interesting one whereby uh, I've had a look at a lot of council strategies, mission statements, objectives, goals of the whole caboose. And I actually haven't seen one which states that the council's objective is to run aquatic and leisure facilities to you know, maximum optimum levels. It is all about um, ensuring that communities are active, that they're healthy, and they're the terminology that constantly arises. So it is an interesting one. Um, as I said, this is a more broader issue um, than what the uh, you know, current coronavirus has presented about the role of local government in the provision of these facilities. As uh, Jay said, I'm a consultant in this space and probably shoot myself in the foot, um, but it is... Um, 
an, an interesting one and maybe, you know, this current crisis will challenge councils to consider how they might reflect on what they are um, seeking to achieve within their community and how it can best be um, um, yeah, activated. So that, that's the dollar side. Hopefully I'll get a bit more uh, yeah, love in regards to some of the comments regarding health. So if, RJ, if you can go on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Terrific. There's, there's so, a bit of a lag, John, between the yeah. slides. So um, uh, when I change it, it probably takes about 30 seconds to show up on your screen. So feel free to sort of just keep yeah, it. No, I've got it here. So um, I think we're all off and running. Regarding the health, as I said, it's it's an interesting one about what, what, you know, what the end goal is about councils operating aquatic leisure facilities. And um, uh, I'm not sure people are familiar with the Victorian Order General's Office report uh, 2016, I was leisure put that editorial in there, but it just really did ask the question about um, uh, what, what are local councils doing in regard to the monitoring, reporting and evaluation activities of the running of these aquatic leisure facilities? And certainly this, um, you know, I think that's a really healthy time right now, pardon the pun, but uh, be re revisiting uh, why it is that um, councils are actually building and then operating or having operated these aquatic leisure facilities and are they really achieving the objectives for which they are uh, set up for and whether there's actually other ways in which these objectives can be better achieved especially if the outgoings are operationally one or two million dollars per year and not even take into account the capital costs initially to build the facilities but you know the, the, there's no doubt having said that that the facilities do have an enormous impact it's just trying to grasp a little bit further what that impact is and to whom actually um, it's being targeted. Certainly, um, you know, Active Exchange and some of these other uh, system reports by KPMG have highlighted, um, you know, the significant um, social value, but some of the social impacts and some of the modelling, I think it's just a really interesting time to actually ask, well, can some of those monies be best spent by, you know, identifying who the target groups are and um, how that, that can be addressed. And I've actually under, recently undertaken an exercise talking to about 10 local councils about this particular issue. And um, without going overboard, um, it does seem that the, the, the industry still struggles to actually understand what the outcomes are that are being achieved within these facilities and how targeted they are. Certainly, had some great conversations with the City of Brimbank that are doing some exciting stuff in association with the university. And I think City of Burundara are, but um, um, yeah, it would appear that there is still this element of uh, understanding the impact. And I suppose that ties into about what we as health and aquatic leisure uh, specialists can be doing in regard to performing outcomes within the centre. Now, this whole topic is about being bold and brave and it is about bold and brave in the context of finance, but it's also maybe in the area of uh, health and about really taking the opportunity of saying, right, we are really are going to uh, step up the plate and have a significant impact. Just um, uh, sharing with you related to that issue about the existence of aquatic leisure facilities and about achieving outcomes. Um, up until, and I probably dodged a bullet here, but it was running a, going to be running a, a study tour uh, to Vancouver, which is, um, very similar to um, Australian environment in regards to the culture, demographics, and the facilities that they provide and the um, approaches of local government. Felt that on the way probably should pop into Los Angeles. And it was just interesting to note that uh, really local government don't see a role in the provision of aquatic, uh, sorry, in leisure and health and fitness facilities. They just run the outdoor pools. Um, so, uh, and um, obviously putting time and energy into a range of other um, uh, activities to address, you know, um, uh, health health issues within their communities. So uh, it's not unprecedented to actually be focusing in on the outcomes rather than the bricks and mortar in which it's to be achieved. Um, I suppose um, this coronavirus has probably challenged us in regards to the way in which, you know, we do provide services. So use the word we pretty loosely, you guys. Um, and um, I think the industry should be applauded in how adaptive it's been in being able to respond to the circumstances of not having their doors open. And uh, 
the range of online services uh, quite extensive and it's going to be interesting to see how much of those services remain and whether you'll be continuing, you know, you might continue to provide dual services um, and perhaps even continue to expand on um, an online um, uh, service offering. Certainly some facilities are providing opportunities through um, uh, uh, hiring of equipment and the like. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. And I suppose um, with regard to the social, social isolation and these restrictions of 20 people, it might increase whether there's opportunities becoming more community-based in terms of getting out into the community and um, um, certainly providing services, whether it be at parks or in um, nursing homes uh, or the like, to actually, um, you know, enable people to become fitness, you know, become active without necessarily having to come into the into the centres. So, you know, some of those service models um, are going to be interesting um, as as you continue on trying to you know confront these challenges. I think the the other interesting thing, and it probably goes back to you know what the end goal is and what sort of facilities do we have, but Obesity and mental health, um, all the reading suggests that they are the, the two key issues that the, our communities are being confronted by. Once again, uh, being a bit contentious here, but um, uh, you know, how effective are the aquatic and leisure facilities in, effect, uh, in a, addressing the issue of obesity and mental health? I remember at a centre I was involved in, we actually did a study at participants 12 months after they joined and found that the actual um, uh, their their weight, if that's only the sole indicator, was basically the same, and it was pretty much uh, pretty uh, was the same as when they joined 12 months earlier. And it was about a third had actually put on weight, a third had actually lost weight, and a third were about the same. So the average were nothing had been achieved. And it is interesting that uh, aquatic leisure facilities, by and large, do continue to focus on um, phys um, physical activity and. Um, it would be interesting with any centres really said, well, hang on, let's look into the area of whether weight management or dietary advice or nutritional advice uh, stepped up the plate there and actually provided a broader range of um, activities in that regard and really um, had a greater impact upon this whole issue of obesity, which continues to be um, uh, increasing in our communities and probably hasn't helped through the coronavirus. Mental health, that's an, another one whereby I do appreciate the number of centres are, um, now are starting to look at mindfulness programs and looking at um, meditation, but a range of other programs that maybe this is an opportunity of aquatic leisure facilities to perhaps dif differentiate themselves in regards to other private uh, facilities and other services that are out there um, um, within the surrounding areas. Um, and loneliness, um, I read a report the other day that said that the loneliness is a greater issue than obesity. Um, how, under these circumstances, might we address uh, people and their loneliness and particularly where probably the whole essence of social distancing and social isolation is only so, you know, is to contribute even more so to that loneliness. So is there a role that, um, you know, local government in their recreation, aquatic leisure and health can be undertaking a greater role. So I said, this is the bold and brave and it might may be actually at far greater expense, but it was interesting. I was listening on another webinar uh, the other day from Andrew Day, uh, who's the CEO of the um, City of Manningham. And certainly when he was discussing about what their council's approach, um, didn't talk about finances once, it was about addressing some of the real key health initiatives and certainly, um, um, you know, up in the ante and he was really speaking about some of the groups that were at risk previously in terms of um, their health needs and potentially saying this is a challenge to even be more proactive and he was particularly talking about young women and their uh, reduced um, activity um, once they get to you know adolescence so um, you know my understanding is that that's going to be a goal there and once again uh, that might be replicated in councils right throughout uh, saying right, well, we are, uh, we have got a, a cold community that um, we really need to be more proactive. So once again, is it the time to be, you know, stepping up the plate and be more proactive, even more so proactive in these times? Um, pricing, um, 
I spoke about that in the context of finance, uh, but it can easily just flip, be flipped across to health and in the area of um, uh, greater um, accessibility. Um, probably going to be a bit of a catch-22, whereby we encourage greater participation through pricing in an environment that we're currently constraining um, access. So that, that, that is going to be a challenging one. But um, the, the, you know, all the in, um, information coming out about this coronavirus is it's certainly impacting upon health, but, um, you know, the economy is suffering. And as a consequence, there's lots of higher levels of unemployment and people's disposable income is going to be lower. And is that therefore creating a real challenge that uh, uh, those people who are most disadvantaged in our communities, that number of people is going to be greater and they're the ones that aren't going to be able to access the important uh, services that you know, local government particularly do provide. And um, is there opportunity for you know, greater concession rates? Is there opportunities for increased eligibility uh, for access to concessions? Um, I know something I saw um, in the US uh, when I was over there a number of years ago, run by the YMCAs, whereby their membership models basically um, people are showing their um, um, group certificate, their uh, annual earnings, which is a bit radical, but um, uh, it seemed to be applying, uh, applied well. Another one which has been tried in other sectors is um, people just paying what they can afford. Um, certainly, you know, you're putting yourself out there, but um, uh, is that another option that we should be considering? Once again, trying to really understand that, uh, yeah, that this is probably a time that uh, community needs access to these services more than ever. Another interesting one is having seen in other parts of the world is um, use of volunteers. Um, now within our sector, um, and I'd love to be challenged or informed, but uh, largely we don't utilise volunteers, but uh, really through the use of volunteers when we're addressing issues of loneliness, about issues of mental health, and about some challenging ways in which we deliver our services, the opportunity of being involved, having a greater number of volunteers within our facilities and obviously, volunteers aren't there to replace um, paid staff, but they're there to complement. And as I said, I've seen um, certainly, once again, in Vancouver and Toronto, some excellent examples where facilities that provide the core then have these whole range of additional programs and services, especially for underprivileged communities, by the engagement of volunteers. Is that something else that prevents some opportunities? And getting into my um, final item, um, it's regarding collaborations. And uh, I think this is a great time to be fair income about collaborations. Um, I, my observation is that local government aren't that great at it. Um, and I believe that um, certainly uh, when talking about outsourcing in the past, there was you know, in, in the earlier part of the presentation, uh, you know, some of the great strengths of the outsource model is that these are organisations that specialise, have scale and are therefore able to invest in marketing activities, procedures and systems, training, people development um, and a range of um, similar resources that local government by and large don't benefit from. Um, lots of local government centres do operate um, uh, in isolation, and it just intrigues me, having worked for the YMCA for you know thirty odd years, looking at local councils and going from one council centre to another centre to another centre, just seeing things being reinvented and reinvented, and probably even the way in which you know the response to the coronavirus um, highlights that uh, uh, whilst there's some terrific resources that are you know coming out and can be collectively utilised, um, yeah, there is just uh, yeah, one wheel being invented in one community and a wheel being um, invented in another. And so uh, I've been doing some work with the, um, a group of about 10 managers in the southwestern region of Victoria, uh, locations such as Colac, Hamilton, Warrnambool, Stall, um, Port Ferry, coming together and just discussing the whole concept of actually putting a manual, you know, an operating manual together as one council. Um, shouldn't be that radical, but it just does seem to be uh, not overly common, and certainly I, I, you know, appreciate that ARB have a management uh, group that are looking at some of these options. But um, I, I do think this is a great time, um, you know, for 
increased collaborations between local councils and um, within the industry. Just talking to RJ uh, before we got started, it was just interesting, um, a range of webinars that are on at present, but um, still a you know, bit of a clash there in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, the um, yeah, collaboration which could have occurred to actually, um, uh, you know, have been greater benefit to the, to the industry. Um, I, I suppose um, collaborations, uh, and look, there is lots of opportunities for councils to work with other councils, but it, from my perspective, it just seems to be fly in, fly out, and um, often there's not uh, a lot of follow-up. Follow I suppose that's one of the advantages in the southwestern region is that you know, I've been able to do some of the, a little bit of the lifting in between meetings, acknowledging that uh, councils, um, you know, you've got your primary role, which is to deliver on the you know, objectives at that aquatic and leisure facility. But I think the idea of actually coming together beyond the superficial sharing of a few ideas and then wandering off, but really actually creating some resources together. Once again, that collaboration in Southwest, there has been some discussion about group purchasing and about marketing. And once again, I understand there are other conversations going in that regard. Uh, Central Victoria, uh, we're going to be doing another um, regional roundtable fairly shortly as well, where some of these conversations are to be had. But as I said, that's at the base level. I just wonder in the future uh, whether it can be of a higher level. Um, I live in the city of Whitehorse, and I don't know the intricacies, to be honest, but I'm actually a member of the Manningham Whitehorse, Whitehorse Library. And I don't know, the, as I said, the ins and outs of it, but certainly the library services within Manningham and Whitehorse seem to have been one. And I'm just, you know, wonder if this is the time for councils not to be considering how they might work more collaboratively and invest in, uh, you know, basically creating and developing resources together. I suppose that's whilst an opportunity for local governments to be working with local governments. The other opportunity, I suppose, is whether there can't be greater collaboration with local government and the private sector, whether that's through um, uh, the operation and delivery of services um, uh, in the management model approach, or in fact with not-for-profit organisations. I mentioned Brimbank earlier. I don't know if John Clark's out there somewhere, but uh, um, you know there is some pretty exciting stuff going on there whereby, hopefully I'm not speaking out of school if he is, but um, about their new facility that is being built out there and how a number of not-for-profit and um, very specific um, uh, service organisations targeting populations that don't generally attend aquatic leisure facilities are going to be based within the facility and which will then be a benefit to actually having the people come into the facility but also those people that know that particular segment of the community, those specialists to be able to inform and um, educate the, um, the aquatic leisure staff and whether there's greater opportunities on, and I wonder if that's an, my understanding is that was achieved through an expression of interest process and whether other councils might not want to consider other approaches for going for expression of interest or just spending time uh, making contact with various groups, whether they be disability groups or um, uh, uh, cold community groups or aged services or the like, just having the conversation and understanding uh, if there's any opportunity for collaboration in programs or even facility enhancement and design with funding coming through other sources, non-traditional sources. Um, and just even about those collaborations, the, um, you know, the opportunity for council, at least working with another council and doing peer reviews, it just does intrigue me how um, centres do, yeah, as I said, work you know, um, as islands and not uh, getting other centres to come in and have a look at the way in which they operate in regards to both the you know, the financial performances of the centre, is there any scope for the comparison of benchmarking data? Is there just, a, you know, uh, an opportunity to drill quite deeply about, you know, how well things are going in one centre and learning off another? So, you know, whether that's a one-on-one -on -one or through, you know, these round tables or the like, but, uh, yeah, I, I just think this is a great opportunity for greater collaborations. As I said, the challenge is probably beyond the meetings, and more about investing into an infrastructure because whilst I spoke before about the inside, um, outsource model and about the inability to really make comparisons between the corporate expenses between both, 
the numbers and the dollars being spent on the creation of resources specific to aquatic leisure facilities from the local government that actually run, offers so many varied services, um, it just doesn't seem to be an overly productive way in which to, to develop and then resource, you know, management and operators. So um, I think, you know, that's another opportunity, uh, a challenging one. And as I said, um, you know, there's a few ideas, a bit loopy, you might uh, might say in regards to this presentation, a few contentious, but hopefully a few here that might stimulate some ideas, whether that's in the current, you know, coronavirus environment or on a longer term basis. So I've been yapping on a fair bit. Um, uh, hopefully stirred up some uh, some questions that people would like to throw at me. So um, on that note, I'll hand it back to you, RJ. Thanks, John. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been writing a lot of notes here and and throughout the sort of um, presentation, there's been a whole bunch of, you know, various opportunities um, that you've thrown out there, as as well as well as some of the uh, limiting beliefs. I think really that that the industry um, can tend to have, and it's interesting, you know, um, you know, you you you've worked in the industry and and on the industry and. And um, and when you sort of step out, I, I wonder if that gives a bit more perspective as well. And you see the, you see a bit more on the on the horizon, and you, see, you know, the 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 spread of what you see is is more. Um, I I've got a few things here I'd, I'd love to ask. Um, if anyone has questions for John, please drop them in the comments. John Clark uh, has has uh, indicated he is listening, John, and and um, and uh, he he said hello. Um, Thank you. It's a, it's, I'm, I'm hoping I didn't say anything out of school there, John. Thank you. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, it's a beautiful centre that they're planning out there at the moment. Um, obviously, we were involved in the design um, from a safety perspective uh, from the very start and met with John and the architects and the aquatic engineers. Um, and it's it's just going to be a fantastic community asset out there in in, uh, in St Albans. So, so uh, you know, hats off to John uh, Clark who who's obviously very um, forward thinking and, and and thinking about all the various moving parts. And I've John Clark as well, we're, we're, we're gushing over here. Well, I've been following your um, LinkedIn posts about all the renos and things like that that you've been doing uh, in your facilities over the closure period. So um, so certainly, you know, Brimbank taking advantage um, of the opportunities that are out there, even through crisis. Um, John, you mentioned collaboration and councils. So I want to I want to throw in task forces. So we sent out in our newsletter last night. We're, we, we're establishing industry task forces. It's our intention that uh, John uh, John Summers here would be would be involved in those. Um, in London, I don't know if everyone's familiar. They have the the London Fitness Network, which is all the council or public owned uh, facilities. If you're a member at one, you can visit any of them. Obviously, London's uh, you know people move all over that city for work. Melbourne's no exception. Um, you know, the, 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 the notion that, you know, a council facility in, say, Doncaster or, or Whitehorse, like uh, Nana Wadding, would be competing against each other is a, is a complete fallacy. But if, you're, if your member lives in one municipality and works in the other, um, having the option to visit both um, is advantageous to, to both facilities. So there's a, there's a retention piece in there. I think we've got a, an incredible opportunity to work on, you know, a reciprocal access model between all council on facilities um, in in the state of Victoria and I think I think it could only do good things for membership numbers um, Andrew day I used to work for Andrew he's a obviously a, a very visionary leader um, um, re really um, really visionary out there at Manningham um, I wonder as well John do you think there's often you talked about the op the service models and um, we had on the on the show on Tuesday, Adam Luscom out at Salk, and they're doing um, everything is you know for lap swimmers right now. They're they're one swimmer per lane, but you book a lane uh, on on an app, and you you show up, you get an hour, um, forty five minutes swim, and then they do fifteen minutes of sort of time to change and get cleaned and everything, um, and they clean the clean the area. Um, do you think there's you know, when we when we look at service models, what what kind of opportunities are you thinking about? I used to work at Brunswick Baths, and we used to do yoga in the park, and because we didn't have a lot of space in the actual facilities there, so we were at the time trying to get out of the facility and into the parks and get more and more people engaged. I know City of Moreland have been working very hard 
uh, in that space for a number of years now. They they do an active week and they you know they run a whole bunch of community fun runs and races and events and carnivals and it's all it's all geared around getting active. Um, what what kind of opportunities do you see in that service model space? Oh, well, first of all, you mentioned about the task force. Is it just, can I just go back to that and just note again, once again, for the collaborations is um, my observation in working with local government is there's a lot of, hopefully I can use this phrase okay, but can't see the forest for the trees. So it's just so much, so many demands, and maybe there's conversations to be had with managers, managers about not being able to be overly strategic and long-term and actually, you know, be given the opportunity of, you know, really committing to task forces and um, working groups because I've certainly been involved in a few and, you know, a dozen people have turned up and then you see four turn up and then there's work to be done outside of it. And so I think um, it's not only having task forces, but it's being committed to the task forces. And, and look, going on to that, um, um, the, you know, the, the service model, just a matter of interest, the, uh, uh, the SELC, approach were they charging premiums for that one lane booking or no so so adam's view and and i, I think and i think adam's on the money um if i'm being honest i think so his view is that just like the local pub that you know used to do um you'd go in and have a pub meal now they're doing you know uber eats he said he said you've got to adjust the service model accept a little bit of a loss right now to get people back into your facility so um, and and there's, there's every chance that, you know, if you're a dedicated lap swimmer, for example, and you start swimming somewhere, um, that you would then start to um, maintain a loyalty to that facility or something like that. You know, if you, if you get a good service level, you're happy with what you're getting, you know, you, you might be unlikely to change. Um, so... So, so they're, I think they're charging $9 for non-members, $7 for members, and they've suspended all of their um, direct debits and membership fees during the period. Yeah, yeah. So once again, you know, you mentioned about Moreland. I'm familiar with some of the great programs that are occurring there. And, and I suppose that, that's just going back to the evolution of aquatic leisure facilities and the delivery of a gym and a learn to swim and rec swim. If you talk about those three, you're talking around about 85% of your, your income and really uh, the gyms are being delivered by others and um, uh, so it probably is up to local government to look at opportunities in the health and fitness space to be more true to the objectives and mission of the council to um, enable greater access and inclusion. As I said, my understanding is that you know, the city of Moreland certainly has a high uh, level of um, um, ethnic population or you know cold communities and they've been quite proactive in addressing uh working with those people um you know they've got the active moreland program and certainly there's other programs similar um across the state but um yeah the intricacies of those um yeah i i suppose just going back to my point i think there's a lots you know reading in council reports there's lots of great stories and great programs out there but um, you know, how they're being measured, measured and monitored and being, um, yeah, very much targeted. I think, you know, that's probably the challenges we spoke about with Andrew uh, Day. You know, there was a particular group that they were really aiming towards um, uh, working and, um, you know, addressing the, the potential risks to that particular population. Yeah, yeah. I agreed and and um, you know you see I, I think I think um, Kim out at Moreland and, and and there's been a number of uh, directors out there over, over the journey I think Andrew Day at one stage was at Moreland um, and yeah. you know Chris Levers um, some really really strategic um, operators that have that have been really key in sort of driving those that 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 whole of community and outcomes focused. Um, and results. I know. I know. Talking to you know the facilities uh, in that region. You know they they measure uh, using technology like the the body scanners. Um, they measure how much you know fat has been lost, for example, across the municipality through the leisure centres. They they measure 
you know, bone density increase and, and, and muscle mass increase and all that, all those metrics that you can get through technology now, they, they report on those types of things so the council can can really measure and quantify the impact that ledger facilities are having. I know Belgravia are obviously uh, partnered with Active Exchange and they're getting really good data in terms of social outcomes um, in, in that space. You know, we, we really are moving into that era um, and there's some, there's some key challenges. Um, Liz uh, has asked it, has the question around your thoughts on task forces. Um, that if you have a, um, if you if you get expertise involved for a particular project, uh, then once that's complete, the group ends. Um, would that be seen as less commitment? I, I think I think that would be the intent, anyways, of a task force. But do you do you have any thoughts on the sort of branding of how you do these things, John? Oh, yeah, I think the clarity of what the the, the purpose and then yeah having a having it and and well I think task forces are different than creating these ongoing en entities so I think that's that's the challenge of actually creating a you know an aquatic leisure marketing um, unit which obviously is going to challenge lots of local councils own marketing units that's an ongoing one but yeah for a particular task force um, yeah I suppose there's some task forces that will come together and look at issues and then continue to address issues as they arise but yeah those that actually come together for a specific um, program they're generally more successful because people are quite clear on what they're you know why they're there and you know what their time frame is going to be but I, I just yeah without I just think there's greater challenges beyond the task forces um, which is task forces are great but I just think there's opportunities to be more structured, commit the resources to get some real outcomes. Um, um, yeah, I've probably said enough on that one. It's like, yeah, it's like everything. You need someone to drive it, right? You need someone to drive it and you need someone that's got the experience in, in delivering an outcome. So, um, and and who has some resources behind it. You know, when we, when we put together you know, you, you look at some of the networking committees and things like that that are out there, and you know, it's you, you keep coming back to the same agenda items every every quarter for literally years. You know, and you think, well, yeah. nothing's actually progressed. So, so terms of reference, clear objectives. It's what you know. We do that with our platinum pool steering committee. We have a a plan and a page. It's like a business plan for the committee. Every year, it gets reviewed, and the outcomes the outcomes have to be delivered. You know, and if they're not delivered, the, there's certainly an expectation from that stakeholder group that. You know why wasn't this delivered? Um, so, so it's it's all about it's all about you know committing to the path ahead. I agree, um, and uh, and and you know documenting that and 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 having clear de clear deliverables um, and and the the appropriate authority to carry them through. Um, okay, any any other questions coming through, guys? I mean, we've got uh, we've got a little bit um, we've got a little bit in there. I think I think um, I think as well having the right expertise. You talked about outsourcing. You know, the guys down at Western Leisure Services, you know, I know Alex had KPMG in doing, you know, data op like optimization of their, you know, um, data and IT systems and things like that to to get really good um, insights into how people use the facility. Um, so, you know, like they can, they're sort of tracking, you know, members and, you know, this person only goes to the the crash and the warm water pool. So let's let's make sure that our um, our marketing targets that, or or that we or that we find out if they just don't know about other services or they're shy. How, how can we sort of better uh, engage that person? Um, I think I think that's a space we see as well. As you know, you, uh, a lot of a lot of councils would be happy to, and this isn't to have a swipe at all. It's just an observation that um, that happy to invest lots and lots of resources and particularly man manpower hours into into like human human capital into into uh, projects um, that maybe they don't necessarily have the appropriate expertise in, and so the end result doesn't really, it, it, it might not necessarily hit the mark. So, so there's a piece in that. Obviously, obviously, other industries and and you know, state government get engaged consultants quite a bit. Um, is that a space? It's probably a bit um, self-interested coming from us, but is that a space that industry should consider more? And and what are the benefits of engaging appropriate expertise? Are you, are you still there, John? 
Yes, yeah, sorry, was that a, there was the question there, sorry. Okay. Sorry, yes. Yeah, it wasn't rhetorical. I was I was interested <laughs> in your thoughts, interested in your thoughts on engaging, you know, expertise and obviously obviously at a you know at a at a state and federal government level they engage, you know, consultants and industries uh, a lot more. Uh, local government they're, they're starting to move into that space more and more, but but I think certainly in our industry it's still a lot of things are still done in-house and what 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 is your view on on engaging appropriate expertise, noting that you know it's self interested from the two of us really to be talking about it. Yeah, look, I, I can. You mentioned before that um, you know I was with the YMCA for many years, and then I had the opportunity of going out and uh, looking at what's out there in terms of how things are operated through uh, a number of operators. And it's probably yeah, you know, got to be careful how I say this, but one of the things that has intrigued me in the operation of in-house operated aquatic and leisure facilities, uh, just how brilliant some uh, are operating and just probably how others probably are just operating below par. And there is an element of obviously the management and leadership, but it's also probably the, the, the amount of investment and love that actually flows through from the council in, you know, in question, I suppose. And, um, you know, that's an interesting one whereby, yeah, it just seems like some operate on an oily rag and, uh, uh, you know, some of the activities uh, that are operate in an aquatic and leisure environment, obviously the number one um, priority is about health and safety issues. And, you know, it's I get a little bit nervous going through some places and thinking, gosh, this is a place that is very risky and I'm not sure that this council's really got a grasp of how risky it is and I suppose it's also got an opportunity for you know maximize perform uh, maximize attendances through great marketing initiatives and great program and service delivery and and certainly um, in a regional environment uh, you've got a feel for some of the managers that um, uh, yeah yeah do live a, a little bit on their own there and I suppose finally getting to your question I think the the idea of uh, having resources that actually understand this unique industry in which we operate within and actually have those pooled resources available to those centres would be extremely beneficial. And probably, I would have thought, could be even more financially viable than maybe having some of that investment not being overly productive in a local government environment, which has got such a range of services that they, you know, not, not, just doesn't have the specialist skills to be able to service um, yeah, in this case, the aquatic leisure to the air to the level that it probably should be. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you, John. Um, I'm just just conscious that we're sort of come, we've just come up on twelve o'clock here. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. It's been fantastic um, having you, John, uh, on the show. Obviously, a wealth of experience. Um, you know, such a depth and breadth to the experience that um, that many of us will will never achieve in our career. So it's been an honor to have you uh, on the program, and and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you everyone for taking time to to listen in today. Um, the recording will be available on the web page. Make sure you tune in uh, tomorrow. Customer um, uh, customer innovation excellence. I think it is tomorrow. It's about the customer experience, and then uh, again, uh, have a look at the program for next week. Uh, on behalf of Fitness Australia and Lifesaving Victoria, thanks very much, John, again. And uh, we hope everyone have a, a fantastic rest of your day today. Thanks, RJ. Bye-bye. Thanks.